grateful. I'm grateful that, that our church is full of wonderful influences, wonderful influences. If you have your Bibles this evening, please turn with us to Psalms chapter 95. Psalms chapter 95. Uh, we'll be reading verses 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. Now, years ago, when I started, Pat, when I started preaching, uh, my dad uh, made me uh, go through and encouraged me. Didn't make me, but he encouraged me to go through and and and, and look at the uh, a thirteen week lesson. Now I pretty much knew all the things, but but what it was, it was encouraging me to to build a strong foundation in my ministry. And, and part of that thirteen week lesson was a, a lesson on worship, and that's what I want to cover here today. I'm sure that we have looked at this. If you have went to Brother Larry's class in some time or another, you have looked at some form of this. Uh, I'm sure that on one Wednesday night about seven, possibly eight years ago, we have looked at this as well. I looked back on some of my things, but I want to look at it once again. Uh, and over the next little bit, I want to be covering some, some uh, biblical doctrines as well. Uh, I want to caution you just a little bit, uh, and this has nothing to do with what the lessons on right now. Well, I guess it does. It's fundamental uh, things that we need to look at. But I want to caution you if somebody says, well, I don't preach doctrine, I don't teach doctrine. May I caution you to be weary of someone that says that? Uh, we need biblical doctrines in our lives. We need biblical doctrines in the pulpit, uh, in, the, in the teaching uh, part of our church, in the living part of our church. We need those biblical doctrines. And hopefully here in the next little bit, uh, we'll be looking at those. Uh, I maybe want to get some other people's, uh, you know, uh, I guess maybe some others uh, involved in that as well. Uh, you know, so you can not just uh, hear me all the time, uh, but you can, you know, get another perspective of some things. And I think that'll be good. Uh, but tonight we want to look at worship. Uh, you know, I could go around and I don't call out, you know this, I, I don't call out on Wednesday night. You know, what does worship mean to you? You know, it, it could mean a, just a, a whole lot of different things. Uh, but what it, what, what it needs to be, it needs to be true. Uh, it, it doesn't need something that's play acting. Uh, you know, my grandma used to say, well, what kind of play purdies did you get for Christmas? Now, if you're not from Appalachia, you probably don't know what a play purdy is. Uh, but we all here know what a play purdy is. It's a toy. I mean, I guess maybe I ought to tell you something. You may not know what to play. It's a toy. You know, a lot of people are play acting and putting on a big scene and showing off all the play parties that they think they have. And all it is is just an act. We need to worship the Lord in sincerity and in truth. We need to come to Him and pour out our heart to Him with everything that we've got. It doesn't matter. Uh, there, there's, there's many different ways uh, of worshiping Him. But we need to worship Him with everything we've got. Let's look here. To, just remain seated as we look today. Psalms 95. Psalms 95. Psalms 95 and verses 6. And verses 6. It says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us, uh, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God... And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Father, have your blessing, Lord, upon this reading and, Lord, upon this lesson. Lord, we thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think here today, worship uh, in, in the modern sense is being neglected greatly. Now, I can remember uh, uh, hearing stories, I can remember of hearing accounts uh, back in the, the early 50s. Uh, there, was a great, there was a great turnabout uh, in my community where my family grew up. Uh, there was, uh, there, and, and, and even back in the 20s, uh, back in the, the 20s and 30s, uh, there was a great turnabout uh, in the community where I grew up. Uh, and even I can remember uh, uh, driving, past, driving past what they all call the old campground. Uh, you know, everyone had a campground in their community. Everyone had a place. And, and there was just some old structures that had fallen down, uh, and they had used it for cattle, and they'd use it for storing things. But that was on the campground on Campground Road. Now all of it's tore down, and somebody has a, a house built there. But, uh, you know, those were things back in the 20s. Those were things where people didn't have a whole lot. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't know a whole lot, maybe possibly about God's Word. But when they learned about God and who Jesus could do, what could Jesus could do for them, they wanted to worship Him with what they had. 
If it, and if a lot like my family, it wasn't that much. Uh, and they worshipped him. But I think so many times we get caught up in the comfortable things. Now, I don't know about you, but I like padded pews. I've done my share of sitting on all those hard pews, and I don't like them. I figured I'd get an amen on that. Uh, I don't like the windows being opened when it's 95 degrees outside. Have you ever tried to preach with a tie on with the windows open and it 95 degrees outside? It's not very pleasant. So I'm not preaching against, you know, comforts. I like them. I like them a lot. But I think we have allowed those comforts to overshadow our worship. I believe we have allowed our comfort, you know, our, our, our nice vehicles. You know, everyone, everyone probably here has two or three vehicles in their driveway. Uh, you know, everyone here has nice homes. Uh, everyone here has, you know, a, a, a nice job or you've retired from I'm sure. And, and those are things God's blessed us with. And again, I'm not preaching against those because the Lord has blessed my wife and I uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to have good incomes and you provide that for us. Uh, the Lord has blessed us with to be able to, uh, in, in, in previous times past, to work two and three jobs a piece and, and to be able to work ourselves up to where we are now. I'm not preaching against having material things, but what I am saying, when we start placing those above our worship to the Lord, they're wrong. And we have to be careful that we do that. You say, preacher, that'll never happen to me. It can. It can. So let's not neglect the worship that the Lord wants us to have. You know, it, it, remi- it remains uh, that when it's absent, and when it's absent from what we are, and it's absent from the pulpit, it's absent from the children's worship, it's absent from our Sunday school, and it's absent from the lives of the people, that's when we lose the fundamental doctrines and the fundamental practices that a church has to have. We have to have some fundamental, biblical, sound doctrine in our church and in our lives if we want to see sound worship take place. We see here there's three words that can describe worship. There's three words. Now there's a lot of words that can describe you, and I better stay right here. There's a lot of words that, 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 that can describe worship. There, but there's three words that we want to look at. It's an overflowing. It's an overflowing. You know, it's something that, it's, it's like an inner within us and in, that just kind of, uh, just, just flows out from around us. It's something that just moves upon us. Now, I can remember for a short time that we lived in the city. And when we lived in the city, we, we parked along the curb and, and, and the, the storm gutters, every once in a while, we did, we'd have a hard rain and the storm gutters would just overflow and, and they would just flood the streets. And the water, the, the, the water would just take over the sidewalks. It'd take over the streets and, and strand a lot of people in their tracks. But where'd the water come from? It come from down deep in the storm drains. It, it was an inner thing that just, it just took part. It was an overflowing. The storm drains couldn't handle, handle it any longer. The, the, the pipes were just at, at full capacity and more. We as Christians today, there's that inner sense of awe that takes place. Do you think about that for a moment? It's an inner sense of awe. Who can I worship? I can worship Jesus. I can worship the one that gave his life for me. I can worship when I was undone, when I was not even worthy to be called a son, yet he died for me. He had a plan for me. It's, a, it's an overflowing of an inner sense of, wow. This is good. I wish I could just tell it a little better than what I could. Maybe I should have had Larry teach this one so we could have a, a you know, he has this ability to be able to expound and, and, and kind of paint a picture. We see here today that it's an outpouring. It's an outpouring. When we worship the Lord, we are pouring out our heart to Him, expressing our joy. Expressing our joy, expressing our thanks, uh, thanksgiving to Him, and praising what we are feeling about Him inside. Now, my grandmother would sit there and make Afghans. Do you all remember Afghans? Maybe some of you all do that. When I was seven years old, about seven or eight, uh, my, 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 my mamaw, that's what we called him, my mamaw made me an Afghan. 
She said, what colors you want? And I don't know how I picked these colors. I don't know. But it, Brandy says, that's an awful strange looking afghan. I think it's pretty. Because I know who made it. It was mine. She made that just for me. And her means were meager. But every, every, I don't know if you call them stitches. I don't know if you call them, I, I don't know. Every time she'd do whatever she did to make that, she'd try to show me and I, I just, she said, you're moving your hands too fast. And, and, but that was mine. On the back of my rocking chair in my room, I've got that set in there. Every once in a while, I'll go by and I'll look at that Afghan. I never heard my grandmother say one bad word about anyone. I wish my family could say that about me. I never heard my grandmother complain. Raising two children on her own, a divorce in the 1950s, which was very unheard of, struggle after struggle, trial after trial, but I never heard her complain. She just said, I like going to church. I like what my Jesus does for me. That was her way of worshiping. And every time I look at that Afghan, I think of my grandmother. In my mind, she was praying. Every stitch or whatever you call it when you make an Afghan, she was praying for me. She had no idea that I'd still be using it today in my 40s. She had no idea, now that she's gone, that I could look at that and look, to her, and look about the things that she had taught us, but most of all, how she had an outpouring to want to worship the Lord. She didn't look at the things around her that wasn't going right, but she looked at the things around her that the Lord had done for her. That's what causes joy to spring up within us. She didn't use her past, but she used her past to make her future even stronger. That's what worship is. She didn't have a whole lot, but what she had, she gave to the Lord. It's, it, it occupies us. When we worship something, it occupies us. What are you talking about? Well, when we worship something... Jesus Christ. I mean, you can worship any kind of thing, a whole litany of things. But when you worship the true and living God, and you worship Him with everything you got, it occupies those spaces that are so easy to get cluttered. Now, you know what a basement is good for? Clutter. That's all they are to it. Do you know what, a, you know what an attic's good for? Clutter. Some of you are smiling. Some of you spouses are poking each other. And we started cleaning out some things. We wanted to make some bigger, more bedrooms downstairs for our kids. They're getting bigger and they're sharing rooms and they're arguing and they're fussing. And it's just going to be easier for us to give them their own room. And I said, well, are we going to do all this stuff, Brandy? Well, I'd like to keep this and I'd like to keep this. And now that she's not in here, I'm going to wait till she goes to school one day and we'll probably get rid of some stuff. But what I've learned is, if you have a storage space and you want that storage space to stay clean, nine times out of 10, it's not. It's gonna get cluttered. But if you occupy that with something, a chest, or if you occupy that with a freezer, or if you occupy that with a toolbox or a workbench, it's not gonna have an opportunity as bad, as bad to get cluttered. So when we occupy our heart with Jesus, we occupy our heart with the, with the Father, when we occupy our heart with the Holy Spirit, what happens? There's no room for those other things to enter. So worship is, an ocup it, 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 worship is occupying. We are not occupied with our needs or our blessings, but we're occupied with Him. Am I right? We're occupied with Him. Now, note the difference. Note the difference. You know, when we're praying, it's usually occupied with our needs, right? That's okay. Sometimes. 
You know, the Lord tells us, the Bible teaches us, we have not because we ask not. The Bible teaches us that we come to Him and, and lay our needs and our petitions at His feet. But I think sometimes if we were occupied with someone else's needs, ours probably wouldn't be that big. Not all the time, but the majority of time. Our praise is usually occupied with our blessing. Are you noticing something here? Worship's not about us. It's not. It's worship is we are occupied with God Himself. Exclamation point. So it's not about our needs. It's not about our prayers. It's not about our blessings. But it's occupying about who He and what He does for us. It's Himself that needs to be within us. You know, worship is an experience. Am I right? Now, I've, all, I've told you this before. Uh, there's been a couple. My dad would hold revivals and, and, and hold revivals. I asked him one time, I said, how many times did you preach in one year? And he said, there's a couple years there that I preached over 315 times a year. And he'd go all over the state of Ohio. He'd hold revivals everywhere. He'd hold mission services everywhere. And there were some services that I can remember. One service was in Canova, West Virginia. Oh, boy, they were just like us, blue-collar workers. They would come in there after working very long shifts and boy, when they went to church, they went to church. Boy, they were singing like you never heard before. They were shouting in the choir. You say, preacher, was it a show? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, don't put goose pimples on your neck and on your arms when it's a show. There was another time at a church up in Mansfield that, that we went into and boy, you've heard me say this before. Before the service even started, there was piano playing and there was people in the altar. And a lot of times the preaching wasn't even, wasn't, it was just so good that there wasn't any preaching. You've been in those services before. I, I know well, the word is important, but when you allow the Holy Spirit to work, you'd be amazed. It wasn't about themselves being seen or it wasn't about, but it was just an experience that we'll never forget. That we'll never forget. You know, it's a quickening experience. It quickens us. It, it, it quickens something about us. It feeds our mind with truth. Now, in a day and time that we live in, is there anywhere in this world that you can find truth? You can find it in Jesus. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to move upon you and you allow the experience of worship to come in your heart and your mind, it feeds you with the right things. I, had a, I was looking at some other things. I've got an, uh, um, uh, some things I want to look at further on in this year and up to the new year. And, and, and years ago, I've got it. It's a picture of Jesus and you stare at four dots on the nose. Did you all ever see this? You stare at those four dots on the nose and you stare at there for like 60 seconds and then you look on the wall and the picture of Jesus shows up on the wall in your mind. So the things that we look at, you can't tell me that they're not ingrained in our minds and our hearts. So when we are feeding upon His worship and we're feeding upon His things, that not our blessings, not, a, not our prayers, not anything, but when we're feeding upon Him and, and He's giving us what we need, then we truly are feeding upon us. We see here that it's, it, it is an opening of our heart to the love of God. It is the opening of our heart to the love of God. That's what it is. It's an opening of our heart. It's a devoting the will to, his, to the purpose of God. You know, as we turn over into Isaiah chapter 61, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6. We see here today that just look at some things in here regarding, regarding worship. Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 through 12. We see here in verse 1, uh, it, ex it, it shows his awareness in the year of the king Uzziah died. 
I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. It, it, it's, it's showing the awareness of who God is. It's showing the things what God can experience. And it's, he's, he's, he's experiencing God and, 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 and what he is. He said, I saw high and lifted up. So when we worship God, we worship Him as He's high and lifted up. He's above all. And when He's above all, and we're down here, and we're giving Him all the glory, and we're giving Him all the praise, and we're allowing ourselves to soak everything in like a sponge that He has to give us, we feed our hearts and our minds with purity. And, and, and we feed our hearts and our minds, and we understand who He is and where He's at. We see verses 2 through verse 4. It says... Above, above it stood a seraph, and each had six wings, and twain did cover his face, and twain did he cover his feet, and twain did he fly. And, and he, one cried at one to another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So we see it all of his holiness. We're at all of His holiness. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the, uh, uh, and the, post of the door moved at the voice of Him. They were awed. When's the last time that we were at all with what the Lord could do for us? When? I love fall the year. I love it. I like being outside. And I can remember growing up and hearing the wind blow across the corn after it's been dry and it make that rattle and noise. I can remember smelling the fall smell, seeing the leaves change, the cool mornings, standing outside and seeing our breath, waiting for that first frost so we don't have to mow no more, don't have to worry about weeds no more. I like fall. It, it just, something about it points to Jesus. You say spring ought to do that. I know spring shows that Christ is resurrected in spring. I, 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 but some reason, fall does that to me. I see God in His almighty wisdom. As the light decreases, the photosynthesis decreases, only God could do that. Did you think about that? No, bump, no big bang could, can make all that take place. That's God. And you see the beauty of His handiwork? Then when we see Him, how He works in our heart and our life. How He saved us. How He's, how he's still working on us. I'm the potter and He's the clay. He's, as that song said, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. So he's not just working in nature. But if he does that much to nature, just think what he does for his, pro, for his jewel of creation, us. We see here that we adore the majesty of God. We accept the declaration of God. In verses 5, we can see that the sense of our undoneness. Let's look at verse 5. Then said I, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. He says, woe is me. Are you noticing some of the patterns that have to be taken place and some of the characteristics that has to be done in our lives? We have to realize that He is high and lifted up. We have to realize that, 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 it's, that it's, we must be awed, not by us. We must not be troubled by our needs or, or, or set, set apart by the things that we have, but we must be focused upon Him and, and, and adore His majesty and declare that He is God and realize that we are undone. In other words, we're not worthy of what He has to offer. In verses 8 and 9, to be willing to obey God. We see here also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will, who will go, go for us? Then said, I, here am I, send me. And the Lord said, Go, 
tell this people, hear, uh, hear ye indeed, not understand not, and see, see ye indeed, but perceive not. He says, listen, be willing. To, he said, here am I, send me. That's worship. And when we take all of these things and we regard them and we hold close to them as, as the Scriptures explain and the Scriptures command us, then we can have worship like we've never had before. Isn't it good when we come in here and everyone's heart is in tune with the Master? You know, I, I sit over here a lot, and I, I, you know, I love instruments. I love bluegrass music. I love stringed instruments. I, I wish I could play. I really do. Uh, and, but I stand over here, and, and I watch these guys tuning their instruments. You know, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing, but I know it sounds good. And they'll get up here, and they'll tune the bass, and they'll tune the guitars, and, you know, all the other instruments they have. And Why? Where they want to be able to play together. They want to be able to put it all together and, and be on the same song on the same page in the same line. So it all makes sense. We as Christians need to be on the same song, in the same line, and in tune with the Master. We see here some hindrances to worship. You say, what's the hindrances? Well, I've, 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 I've explained, and I hope that I've explained it good enough, some of the things that we can look at, some of the things that we can have. Uh, you know, our holiness, we need to be at all. We need to obey. We need to de declare. We need to realize that we're not worthy. But there's also some things that can stand in our way. You say, preacher, I've never done this. Well, you're probably the only Christian that could ever say that you've never done some of these. A spirit of self-will when we have a spirit of self-will you say preacher what's a spirit i'm not going to testify i don't care well you say preacher i've never said that well when you're sitting back up here and your arms are crossed and you just feel like hmm, kind of tells difference we see over in genesis genesis chapter 4 you say, preacher, I've never killed my brother. I didn't say you did. But self-will comes in many different ways. Self-will is, you know, I don't think I'm going to do that today. I want to do it my own time. Or I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing right now. Why do I need to change for it? In Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 through 7, it says, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain, Cain brought the fruit of, his, of the ground and offered it unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the, first, uh, the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had re, uh, respect unto Abel, his offering. But unto Cain and, uh, and to his offering, he did not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why, hast thou, why art thou wroth, and why hast thou countenance fallen? If thou dost well, thou shalt not uh, accept. Thou, if thou, pardon me, if thou dost, doest well, shalt thou not accept, accept it? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be uh, his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain has his own will. Cain was filled with his own wants. And says, I'm going to do it my way. Now, you know what happened to Cain, the rest of the story. Cain slew Abel. You know the things that taken place. Cain was cursed. And all the things that... If Cain would just been obedient and willful to God's plan, we must, have a spill, we must not have a spirit of worldliness. A spirit of worldliness. Over in 1 John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15. Again, it shows here, 1 John chapter 2 and, and verses 15 through 17. It says, Love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And if uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. 
and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we must have that spirit of not worldliness, but we must have that spirit of separation. We must have that spirit of, I'm not doing the things the world wants to do. You can come in here and put on an act and pray and, 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 and make, a, make a scene of yourself. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows. We see also here that, that we, must have a, 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 we must not be impatient or impatient. Impatient. Over in, in Psalms chapter 27. Psalms chapter 27 and, and verses, uh, verse 14. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I can remember growing up and wanting a bicycle. I'd always had hand-me-down bicycles. Oh, they, they went. They, but I thought, boy, I want a bicycle. I want, I want a new bicycle. So that's when pennies had their catalog. And that's when pennies, you know, you got the, uh, the big, the big uh, Christmas catalog, you know, for pennies. And, and I went through there and I started circling the bicycle. Boy, I started just as soon as that Christmas catalog come out, I started circling. The kids today don't know how fun it is to look through a catalog. Well, that was a big time. We'd have to take turns and everybody'd sit around, passing it around and circling. We weren't allowed to tear pages out, but we could circle it and write down the page number and give it to Mama. Not that we would get it. I'd say, well, this guy over here got a bicycle, and this guy over here got a bicycle, and that's just be patient. Just be patient. Boy, when you're eight, nine years old, if it's past ten minutes, it's not in our, our realm, is it? So when you have to wait three and four and five months, just be patient. You got a bicycle out there. We'll patch the tire and you'll be fine. Or we'll spray paint it up, make it look better. Just be patient. Finally, when the big day came around and I got that bicycle, I thought, boy, it was worth waiting for. And that's not what I really thought, but looking back now, it was worth waiting for. God may not always want us to have what we think we need to have right now, but just stand still. Let Him work. Allow the impatient part of us to go out and let Him be filled. Let us be filled with what He has. We see here today that pride, so man, I've got several on here, but I won't go through all of them, but pride plays a big role in our worship to the Lord. Over in James chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, in James 4 and verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace where, wherewith he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God resisteth the proud, but give us, giveth grace to the humble. Those are some things that can hinder our worship to the Lord. But some things that can cause us to have an outpouring of worship to the Lord is found in Isaiah chapter 6. He is high and lifted up. He is above who we are or what we think. When we feel, woe is me. For I'm unclean. Then we realize that our place is way down here somewhere. And his place is up yonder, way up yonder. That's when true worship can come to our heart. Well, what's worship look like? What's it? It doesn't really have a picture. Some people smile. Some people smile. Some, some of y'all need to smile. But some people smile. Some people raise their hand. Some people shout, and that's okay. That, that's perfectly fine. Some people, it's just a, a deep spring of wail that just flooding their soul, and they can't smile. They can't, they can't even wipe the tears. Maybe there's not even a tear. There, there's just, it's just deep. You know? But however it is, whatever it is, it is occupied with God Himself. 
That's what it is. And when we occupy ourselves with God, we have no room to worship anything else or anybody else, and we have all the room for Him. That's what it's about. Father, I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for my people. Lord, they've been so attentive tonight. Lord, I've messed up and I've, I've mispronounced words, I, but Lord, they've been attentive. And Lord, bless them today. Encourage them. Pick them up. Lord, I thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we all stand today, as Brother Dennis leads us in a course, if we need to come to the altar, let's come. I don't ever leave this church house without opening up our altars uh, for a time of invitation. Let's come if we need to come.